Paulette Goddard in The Gorgeous Huzzy on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Tonight, DuPont brings you the young screen actress Paulette Goddard in the story of a woman whose amazingly modern career burst like a bombshell over the nation's capital a century and three decades ago. Peggy O'Neill was her name, and there are many legends and many true stories about her. Our play tonight is based on both, adapted from the best-selling novel by Samuel Hopkins Adams. DuPont presents Paulette Goddard as the gorgeous hussy. <laughs> Time, wartime. The war, the War of 1812. The place, Georgetown, across the Potomac from the sprawling, ugly new capital of the United States, Washington City. In the parlor of the Franklin Inn, busy hostile to the nation's great, General Andrew Jackson rises to greet a new arrival, John Randolph, the gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Randolph, you're late. We'd almost given over expecting you. Our coach was delayed, sir. Well, things seem much the same here. You're looking very well, Mrs. Jackson. Oh, thank you, John. I'm a mite homesick for the hill, but otherwise fitting enough. Good, good. And how's my little Peggy O'Neill? Ah, wait till you see her, John. She's getting prettier by the day. She's already the best favorite wench east of Tennessee, or I'm no judge. Oh, oh. such talk. Peggy's very fond of you, John. She's fond of the new magic. Oh, why not tell him right out, General? The child's desperate in love with him. Been mooning around here ever since she went away. Oh, but, well, she's only a child. Lieutenant Timberlake don't think so. And who might Lieutenant Timberlake be? The United States Navy. He's spending his furlough here at the inn. Overstated her, I miss my guess. And all because of Peggy. Well, you don't think he'd try to make love to her, do you? He'd be a fool if he didn't. <laughs> well, it's the truth, Rachel. John, it's plain to see you're in love with a gal and she with you. Why don't you propose to her? Get it over with General's right, John. Peggy ain't one to wait too long for a man. Timberlake's a handsome scoundrel, too. Takes her to the theater and all. Where is she? Oh, she's in the tap room, tending bar. Tending bar? You'd best be gentle, John. You hear me? Oh, the Nellie B's are packed when she falls. Peggy. John. John Randolph. Oh, it's so good to see you again. What... What are you doing behind this bar, Peggy? Well, Father's ill. I sent Cree to the city to fetch my new gown from the dressmakers. Uh, that's no excuse. You want people to think you're a common barmaid? Well, why not? Because you... What about this Timberlake fellow? Have you met him? Peggy, now, this is no joking matter. Don't you know what they say about ladies who go about with sailors? No, and I don't care. But I do know one thing, that sailors are fighting this war for us. Why, you congressman, you talk, 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 and do nothing to help. That's not true, Peggy. Oh, I'm sick of your talking advice. I'm going to marry a man who's doing oh, things. Peggy. Mary, uh, would you mind fastening this pesky stock for... Oh, pardon me, I thought you were alone. Oh, it's quite all right, Lieutenant Timberlake. I want you to meet an old friend of mine, Mr. Randolph of Roanoke. Pleasure, sir. Glad to know you, sir. I hope that you'll make Peggy happy. Goodbye, Peggy. Good day, sir. Oh, John. John, wait. <laughs> You're an odd gent. What did he mean he hoped I'd make you happy? I... I told him I was going to marry you, Lieutenant. You what? Yes, that's what I said. Do you love me, Peggy? Why... Why, yes. Yes, of course I do. I wouldn't marry you if I didn't. I don't understand you, Peggy. I suppose I never will. No, it, it doesn't matter, but... You probably won't. General. General Jackson. Wake up. Well, what is it, Rachel? 
I hear footsteps. Footsteps? Well, confound it, why wake me at this ungodly hour, Listen madam? Listen to me. Listen. I hear two sets of footsteps. What's wrong with that? It was Peggy and, and that seer going down to his room. What? That rascal, that wastrel, I'll carve his ears off, clean to the skull Just bone. Quiet, General. You rouse the whole inn. Confound it, where's that candle? Hey, oh, fetch me my pistol. All right. Oh, General. Hmm? Pull down your night down in the back. Oh. You catch pneumonia where you least expect it. There they are, down the hall. Why, Aunt Rachel, Uncle Andy. Let me at that scoundrel. I'll call his ears. I'll cling to the skull bone. Oh, hush, General. You rouse him. Oh, please, Aunt Rachel. It's all right, General Jackson. We're married. Great day in the morning. Oh. My apologies, Lieutenant. Congratulations. Come, my dear. God bless you, my dear. Thank you, Aunt Rachel. Good night. Oh, Andy, I mistrust this marriage even so. He'll go back to the sea. He'll forget our pig. Well, if he does, he'll be the only man who ever will. You can be sure of that. Andy, you talk like our piggy was just a common hussy. No, Rachel, not a common hussy. A very uncommon hussy. <laughs> In fact, a gorgeous hussy. <laughs> So the curtain falls on the first act of The Gorgeous Hussy, starring Paulette Goddard on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Washington in 1828. Torchlight processions, hangings in effigy, lynchings are the order of the day. To meet Andrew Jackson, the new president-elect of the United States, an angry mob is collected outside Gadsby's hotel. Peggy O'Neill, played by Paulette Goddard, watches anxiously as a coach and four maneuvers its way through the mob to the door. Get out of my way! Get out of my way, you drunken scoundrel! I'll put the lot of you! Come, my dear, while I'm away, Pam. Oh, dear. I'm so scared, boss. Why do they hate us so? Yeah, because they're scoundrels, that's why. Here, lean on my arm, Rachel. Oh, there's Peggy coming to meet us. Oh, Aunt Rachel, Uncle, Uncle Andy, come inside quick. Bring the luggage around the back way for us. Yes, Miss Emily. Charles, I better rest a spell before I climb the stairs. Cross, Aunt Rachel. Here, let me take your thing. Mobs in the street sowing stones at our kind. Oh, tell the General Charles. He better go and live in the President's house alone. It's me they're yelling against. I'm not grand enough to be a president here. I'd shoot every blasted one of them. Oh, don't, Andy. Think of me and my old clay pipe amongst all the gidgads and slumbers of the president. General house. Jackson, can you spare a moment? It's the coachman. All right, all right, all right. I'll be right out. Peggy, talk to her, will you? It'll be all right, Uncle Andy. Thank you, Peggy. Oh, my... oh there now, Aunt <laughs> Rachel. Don't take on so. Oh, I... I ought never to have married him, child. Oh, don't say that. You don't mean it. Yes, I do. I'm going home. Back to Tennessee. I'll never see the president's house. Now, what would the general do without you? He'll do without me. Come with me. The doctor told me a month ago. Mm. Now, I, I reckon it's better so... Oh, well, Rachel. Hey, uh, I want you to look after Andy when I'm gone. Don't let him rear up in his sinful temper. I promise you, Aunt Rachel. He's a great man, Peggy. He'll be a great president. But his tongue is an unruly member. I just can't bear that folks would laugh at him. I won't let them, Aunt Rachel. I swear to you, I won't. Miss 
Mistress Timberlake? Yes, I'm Mrs. Timberlake. You're even more beautiful than they told me you were. I'm Miss Calhoun, Miss Timberlake, vice president's wife. How do you do? I was so sorry to hear Miss Jackson's death. Such a tragedy. Coming just before the inauguration. You must have been almost her only friend in Washington. Why, she had millions of friends all over the country. Oh, really? Yes, really. People who voted for a plain man with a plain wife because they were tired of being cheated by a pack of official snobs. Well, of course, I don't understand politics, Mr. Timberlake. I leave those things to my husband. I see. Mr. Timberlake, I know that the president is very fond of you. He even says you've given him valuable advice. I don't doubt it. You're obviously a clever woman. Mrs. Calhoun, suppose you come to the point. Very well, I shall. Mistress Timberlake, your friendship with the president has become a matter of public scandal. You would best serve his interests if you would take an extended voyage. To Europe, perhaps. In fact, I would be willing to finance such a journey for you, say, $5,000. Is that all you had to say to me, Mrs. Calhoun? Yes. Then good day. Mr. Timberlake, I came to you in good faith. I, I think you owe me some explanation. Very well. Mrs. Calhoun, your husband is a very ambitious man. He wanted to be president. He became vice president instead. So now he would like to have Andrew Jackson impeached and become president anyway. Failing that, he will try to split the union and become president of part of the United States. How did you know all this? Then it's true. Of course not. But... Where did you hear such a story? Like my friendship with President Jackson, it too has become a public scandal, madam. Really, Mr. Stimberlake, you... I dislike gossip myself, Mrs. Calhoun, so I won't tell the story of your trying to bribe me. You poor fool. Who would take the word of a former barmaid against mine? I know one man who will. Andrew Jackson. Absolutely certain of this. I've never been more certain of anything in my life. Then by the tunnel, that's the end. I'll fire those traitors in the cabinet tomorrow. I'll have Calhoun impeached. No, no, you must wait, Uncle Andy. Wait? I've waited too long already. No, please, Uncle Andy, listen to me. You can't do it like that. You're not strong enough and you have no real proof. I don't need any proof. Uncle Andy, don't you see? You've got to have someone else make the first move. You can't make it alone. Then it'll be your fault. Oh, they've tried hard enough to show you as an autocrat, and this will be just what they need. They need. You've got to wait. Well, how long do you think I can wait? Well, at least until after this reception. Your guests will be here any minute. I want to think. I know there's a way. You're right as usual, Peggy. But by that tunnel, it makes my blood boil. I know it does, Uncle Andy. It makes mine, too. Maybe that's why I'm the way I am. Yeah. Well, you know, we're out of the same pasture, Peggy, you and me. Ambitious, common folks who know we've got to go up and on in spite of everything. Because we're better and brainier than all the snobs and the pompous fools who rule men's lives. And we've proved it. And they hate us for it. Yes. Yes, that's what you're like, Uncle Andy. I'm not sure it's as fine as that, what I'm like. I know that what you're doing is mostly for me. And a little bit for you, too. I understand that. No, they're not going to like seeing me here tonight. Then let them lump it. I know, but to see me here as a sort of unofficial mistress of the White House at a reception... But you want to be, don't you, Peggy? Yes. I'd be lying if I said I didn't. Well... Sounds like the guests have arrived. Suppose I got to do my duty. You go ahead. I think I'd better be sort of in the background for a while. Oh, Uncle Andy. Yes, my dear? Don't say anything tonight, will you? Uh, I'll try not to. Mr. Van Buren. Ah, oh, Mr. President. Howdy, Van. Did uh, Madam Jehovah show up yet? The vice president and Mrs. Calhoun. And that'll be her now. 
behind that large ostrich fan. Dear Mr. President, what a lovely reception. So sorry we're late. John's work, you know. Of course. I'm glad you could get here, John. Uh, you, uh, you'll excuse me, my dear. I, I see Senator Eaton across the room. Such a brilliant gathering, Mr. President. So sad that poor Miss Jackson passed away before she could enjoy it. My Rachel never hankered much for the gidgads and flummeries of society, ma'am. <laughs> gidgads and flummeries. How quaint. But surely you intend to enlist one of the cabinet ladies to be mistress of the White House, Mr. President. No, ma'am, I don't. <laughs> the President is just keeping us in suspense, aren't you, Mr. President? Yes. Yeah. Well, we all have our fingers crossed. Then well, uncross them. The new mistress of the White House is standing right over there. What? Why, it's that... Oh, Mr. Stimulake. Yes, Mr. President. I believe you know these ladies, Mrs. Calhoun, Mrs. Barry. Ladies, Mrs. Timberlake. Well, of course, we've met often at Gadsby's, Mr. President. I fear I shall have to ask Mr. Calhoun to see me home. I feel a touch of the vapors coming on. Oh, John. Uh, what is it, my dear? Oh, sorry, Mr. President. Uh, uh, you know uh, the ladies. Such a nice reception, Mr. President. Good night. But, Mrs. Barry, the reception is only just starting. So far as society is concerned, Mr. President... This reception ended when that barmaid entered this room. Good night. Am I all right? Uncle <laughs> Andy. Stop that confounded music. All is over. Well, now, Peggy, this ain't like you. What? I should never have come. Peggy. This is my house. Common people of the United States elected me to live in it. As long as I'm master of it, I'll run it how I please, and I'll have in it who I please. Oh, but now we're worse off than we were before, both of us. And it's all because of me. Maybe some other folks will be worse off before I get through with them. Yes. Maybe they will. That's a gal. We're not licked yet. But, Uncle Andy, you must give me a little more time. Time for what? For what I have to do. What you have to do? Yes, yes, Uncle Andy. Promise me you won't make any open break with the cabinet just yet. Peggy, what are you driving at? Will you promise me? All right, Peggy, I promise, but you've got to tell me. Uncle Andy, please trust me just this once more. I know what I'm going to do is right for both of us. I've always known it somehow. Known what, Peggy? But if I'm going to help you, I've got to be their equal in their eyes. I've got to be the wife of a cabinet minister, too. Wife of a cabinet minister? But how in creation... Well, there's only one way, isn't there? I'm going to marry John Eaton. Peggy, you hardly know the man, do you? I know him. I know him better than he knows himself. What about Randolph or Roanoke? Well? You love him, don't you, Peggy? Yes, yes, I love him in a way, but... But I'm afraid that there's something else I love more. What's that? You know, don't you, Uncle Andy? <sighs> yes, Peggy. I'm afraid I do. <laughs> President, Mrs. John Eaton, see. Oh, sure, sure, right in, will you? Good morning, Uncle Andy. Hey, oh, my, you're looking fine. Oh, I've never felt better in my life. Because, Uncle Andy, we've won. Won? Who's won? What? I've persuaded my husband to resign from your cabinet. He sent a letter off today. Resign? Why, great Scott Peggy, John Eaton's the only man in Washington I can trust, besides Van Buren. Yes, he's resigning, too. Peggy. What made you do it? Well, don't you see? This is your opening. Sounds more like my finish. No, but now you've got something to go on. Something you can bring before the public. Your most trusted advisors quit the cabinet because of the traitorous activities of the other members. 
Goodbye. Gad. John has finally seen it for himself. He'll back you to the limit, and so will Van Buren, and you can dismiss the rest of them tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll fire them today. Now, I'll... Peggy. Yes, Uncle Andy. Peggy, you didn't marry John Eaton just for this. I'm a good wife to him, Uncle Andy. I see by the way, I've been thinking of appointing new minister to Russia. What would you think of Randolph or Roanoke for the job? Why, why I, I think it would be a splendid appointment. And, Peggy, now that we've won, that you've won, are you happy? No regrets? No. No regrets. I hope. There never will be. God bless you, Peggy. Mr. President, gentlemen of the cabinet. Sit down, gentlemen. Make yourselves comfortable. Now, I want no discussion of what I'm about to say, and I'll tolerate no interruptions. There are among us some traitors to the United States of America. Yes, traitors. You call yourselves divisionists, nullificationists, secessionists. I call you traitors. And so... Mr. Branch, I call for your resignation as Secretary of the Navy. Mr. Duggam, I call for your resignation as Secretary of the Treasury. Mr. Barry, I call for... It's what you want, isn't it? No, that's not what I want. You've got what you've always wanted now, haven't you? I wonder if I'll ever know the answer to that question. Oh, Peggy. Why did you let him send me into exile? Oh, I thought it was best, John. Maybe we can both forget all the things that we have to forget. Uh, I hope it'll be easier for you than for me. You do understand why I did what I did, don't you? Peggy, what is it to me whether you save the Union or what not? I loved you, and you used me as you used all the others to satisfy that eternal gnawing ambition. But what's happened to little Peggy O'Neill? What's happened to her, Mrs. John Eaton? Perhaps she's going away on this ship, John Randolph of Roanoke, with you. Perhaps only Mrs. Eaton is going home now to still do what she has to do. Oh. Goodbye, Mrs. Eaton. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, my dear. Ladies and gentlemen, we will hear from Miss Goddard again before the close of our program. Meanwhile, we have some interesting information for you. On this eve of the new year, a nation at work is asking how much can we produce and how soon. And much of this necessary speed in production depends upon how rapidly America can fabricate metal. The quickest way to clean metal for fabrication is by solvent degreasing. Metal, when it comes from the mill, is usually covered with oil and dirt. Before it can be lacquered, plated, or given any final protective coating, it must be clean, absolutely clean. A single oil spot, even a thumbprint, means that rust may develop later, or that the last coating of paint, say, will flake away. You can wash pots or pans or even a family automobile. But how would you go about cleaning, say, the giant metal wing of an airplane, or pilot armor protection for a plane? 
The answer in industry is solvent degreasing. In the degreasing process, a solvent manufactured by DuPont is heated in the bottom of a specially designed degreaser. Vapor rises from the solvent and condenses on the metal to be cleaned. A vapor four and a half times as heavy as air, controlled so it doesn't escape from the tank. The fluid, as it condenses, falls back to be used over and over again, an economy. And with it falls the grease, every bit of it. The metal is taken from the tank absolutely clean and ready for surface finishing. The degreasing tanks themselves range in size from a dishpan to a boxcar. The process has already proved valuable in cleaning machine tools, electric motors, automobiles, mining equipment, and many other things. At present, it is rendering a service beyond price to manufacturers who work with steel and other metals in supplying the armed forces of the United States and friendly nations. To cite only one example, if it weren't for solvent degreasing, we might not be able to turn out airplane motors at the rate at which we're now producing them. Solvent degreasing cleans all newly machined parts before the airplane motor is assembled. Then, after the motor is given its trial run, it is taken apart and studied piece by piece. Of course, after running, the individual parts are covered with lubricating oil, and that has to be cleaned off. Here, solvent degreasing does the job, and a perfect job, in a few minutes. Thus, solvent degreasing does away with bottlenecks in industry wherever the cleaning of metals is a problem. In the present emergency, it is no less than vital. And so the DuPont chemist has added to his peacetime task of making better things for better living through chemistry, the wartime job of helping to make sure that we will enjoy those better things in the future, that we may have them in our time in the sort of world we choose to have our children live in. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the star of tonight's cavalcade, Miss Paulette Goddard. Thank you, Mr. Collier. I just want to say to everyone listening that it's been a privilege and an experience to appear on the cavalcade of America. I only hope that our show this evening has been as entertaining for you to listen to as it's been for me. Oh, I'm sure it has, Miss Goddard, and I know I speak for all of us in saying so. And now, if I may, I'd like to say something about our next show. Next Monday night, the Cavalcade of America will present Lionel Barrymore in an American classic of our time, a story that Cavalcade has presented before and that we feel is particularly appropriate today, a play about America in crisis, perhaps the greatest crisis in all her history. Maxwell Anderson's splendid play, Valley Forge. Don't forget, next week... Cavalcade presents Maxwell Anderson's Valley Forge, starring Lionel Barrymore. On tonight's program, the orchestra and the original musical score were under the direction of Don Bury. Miss Goddard appeared tonight through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, for whom she will presently star in The Lady Has Planned. On the Cavalcade of America, your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes from DuPont. <laughs> National Broadcasting Company.